so proud to be presenting the second Laser Santa Fe. Uh, my name is Andrea Poli and I'm here to kind of tell you about um, what Laser is and uh, what we have planned for the future. And then I'm going to hand it over to our collaborator on this um, event, uh, Lena uh, German, German, and then we're going to introduce our speakers. So that's that's going to be our lineup here. So um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So lasers are Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, and they are happening all over the world. Uh, started by an organization called Leonardo that probably most of you know about. Next slide. Um, Leonardo has been around since 1968. The Lasers has, have been around for about 15 years. They started in the Bay Area. Um, and now, next slide, they are all over the world, really. And this is kind of an out-of-date map, but um, uh, since, as you can see, Santa Fe is not on there yet. Um, but uh, more and more of these lasers are popping up all over. They're streamed live. Uh, there's an audience internationally uh, to see these, and I'm, I'm just so pleased about it because I feel like this is taking the Santa Fe community and all the wonderful and incredible art science um, history and present, and it's, it's showing it to the world. Uh, next slide, please. So I am uh, part of an organization called Biocultura. So we're the official host of the Laser Santa Fe. And Biocultura is myself, my partner John, John, uh, John Donalds, and Madeline Bolding, who's back there. Um, you can get on to the Biocultura mailing list uh, and a specific laser mailing list by talking to Madeline or signing up on the paper there. There's also a tablet that's been going around. You can sign up uh, there. Biocultura focuses primarily on art science in the biology realm, but we've been branching out uh, for these lasers. Next slide. Uh, our next laser is going to be tied in with a big symposium that we're doing in the spring at the New Mexico Museum of History down on Palos Avenue. It's called I Love Life, a Bio Art and Design Symposium for New Mexico. It's going to be April 15th and 14th. Next slide. And we are bringing in speakers from all over the world. We have uh, Pierre Comazzoli, next slide, who is the director of the Smithsonian Consortia, which is all about interdisciplinary initiatives within the symposium between the arts, arts and the sciences, and he's a conservation biologist. Next slide. Um, we're bringing in Victoria Vesna, who is kind of my personal hero in art science. She started, next slide, the Art Science Center at UCLA that has been around for about 10 years and has, is just a model for wonderful art science uh, programming and education. Next slide. Um, we're bringing in J.D. Talisak, who is the, next slide, Director of Cultural Programs at the National Academy of Sciences. And we're also going to have representation from the Santa Fe Institute for Complexity, uh, from uh, Los Alamos Labs, and a whole bunch of really great local things as well at this I Love Life Symposium in April. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lena German, who is our co-sponsor for this wonderful event. Uh, Lena is responsible for this room, and then we're going to have uh, my co-organizer for LASER, Susan Latham, introduce our speakers. So welcome, uh, STEM Santa Fe is hosting this event for you here at the Community College. Uh, my name is Lena German. I'm the founder and uh, chief executive officer of STEM Santa Fe. Um, I've been here in Santa Fe for a little bit over 20 years, but uh, worn many hats. Two years ago, I started STEM Santa Fe. It's a nonprofit that advocates for science, technology, and engineering, and math for uh, the youth, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade for community college, too. Um, we mainly like to put on big events. We uh, and have do hands-on activities with the students and have mentors and STEM professionals work with them and be their role models. In three weeks, we ha are going to host a uh, a Julia Robinson Math Festival. It's an actually an international festival that uh, STEM Santa Fe brought to Santa Fe for the first time last year to New Mexico. And we will be having 200 students, seventh and eighth graders, working on really fun math activities. And we are always looking for volunteers. 
um, who are educators or who are just interested in being mentors to the students. So if you're interested in volunteering, uh, it's exactly three weeks from now, Friday, the February 23rd, and, and let me know. You can talk to me or you can go to our website, stemsanafe.org. So welcome, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Latham. Next. Well, I am Susan Latham. This is kind of odd. I think I'm going to sneak out over the side here. Yes, my name is Susan Latham. You can pick it up. You can just pick it up. Never mind. I'll just put up with this big dark black thing. I am a metal sculptor here in Santa Fe, abstract, fabricated, and um, I have been immersed, uh, my whole life practically has been focused on an interest in science and art. So it is really my great pleasure tonight to introduce to you some longtime friends of mine, Rebecca Dean and Fred Untershare. They have been working side by side, immersing themselves in the uh, science and art of holography for over 40 years. Now, we should give a hand for that. 40 years. Yes. We met each other uh, at the opening of the Santa Fe Complex. How many of you were involved or know about the complex? How many years was it here? I don't don't remember, at, at any rate, uh, then they became involved in my science and art um, organization, which I called the Forum for Science and Art. So for beginning in 1996, I believe it was, I started that and, and we have been, um, uh, we were together for about 14 years. So I've known them for a long time and um, I know that, that to, are you gesturing me for something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, this slide. This slide. Just move it. Oh, the slides. Okay. Just move it ahead. Yeah, okay. So tonight, Fred and Becky, I'll, I'm, I don't want to interrupt with this important <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. No, 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 it's I'm okay. Sorry. But tonight, Fred and Becky want to impart to you their deep appreciation of holography as a way to enhance our lives so that we can have a deeper appreciation and a um, perspective on our world. So I know you're in for a, a wonderful treat. So let's hear it for Fred and Becky. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Fred. Becky. Uh, is under the weather. Stand up, Becky. Even though she can't, she's under the weather back there. Uh, so we're going to try to do the best we can to do this presentation. I'd like to engage you or involve you in um, what we're trying to talk about or what we're trying to do. So there's a few things I want to go over with you first. First of all, is there any of you who are deadly afraid of the dark? OK, good. And again, it, it might be for you guys a little bit harder. We've got a mess of holograms for you to look at. And the thing about holography, which has always been very comforting and extremely awkward, is holography is a show me business. And there ain't no way to see a hologram except by looking at it. You can't, and, and you'll see, we'll show you some slides of some stuff that you'll see firsthand. I wonder if anybody, now this has absolutely nothing to do with holography, but I got a question I have to ask you. Do you think that this guy was left-handed? Now, if you look at so many of those cave paintings, they're almost all of them with the other hand. Now, is he, is he blowing through a tube or is he spitting on it? 
And, and in which hand is using? I would like to think, being left-handed, dyslexic, <laughs> that there was somebody like that way back in the Paleolithic. Help me determine what you think is true. Anyway, onward. And no, like I tell you, nothing to do with anything except I'm, thinking differently. I'm just being thinking a bit differently. Now to get started in here a little bit quicker, let us. I'd like to tell you about ourselves. And but before we do that, before we do that, um, well, let, let me do it this way. Like I said later, after you've seen some of the whole, the work, the explanations and things, we've got a few distinguished holographers with us who are who are locals. And I would very much like to see if we could develop an exchange to talk about seeing differently, perceiving differently. And then what the heck do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is how many of you are photographers? You know, or, or how many of you have had your, you know, you're looking through your, your little cell phones? Have you ever got to the point where you've been looking through things a bunch and then realize there's a difference between the way you see and, and I call it having your camera eyes on? You know what I mean? Or if you've been totally immersed in a book and then all of a sudden you come back to reality. It's that kind of thing that, that I've found very engaging in relationship to my holography friends. We're all going crazy. We're all getting whacked out, but in a very interesting way because you can't do holography without perceiving differently. And so I think for us, it's a very ex interesting way of looking and seeing. The other thing that has happened is, um, what's the next slide? Uh, oh, yeah, we'll get to that slide. Anyway, see we're kind of discombobled here, excuse us a little bit, yes? That's because I'm under the weather, and so yeah. therefore, uh, you wanted to introduce all of that and see. Yeah. So, so let me, before we get into the meat of this, and before we get into to a few of these things, I'd like you to introduce our locals. You've met Fred and Becky, or the team of Beck and Frecky. Anyway, uh, some of the other people here who are holographers in the right, uh, Anna MacArthur, stand up. Anna's, Anna's been doing artwork with holograms in it, has helped start labs and done a lot of holography. There's August Muth, who is the, who's got a facility here called Lazar, and is, is really one of the major thrusts and ability to make very specific kind of holograms here. And perhaps I'll get you, get a little bit later, get him to say a little bit more about what's going on. Also, we've got C, C, wave your hand, C is, C is, C is, is the Be artist. Becky extension at the moment. And any other other holographers in, in the room? Ed, Ed Lau. Well, Ed, Ed's with us, but he passed away last year. Anyway, uh, when we get into discussions, these are some people I'd like to, to bring into discussion and talk about and see what's going on. So let's get into it. Now, the, the thing that's happened with holography, and the first disclaimer you have to do is what holography isn't. And so what I want to make certain is that the holography we, we do, or what, what we've been engaged in, is like what is called true holography. And true holography is called wave front reconstruction. And we'll get to that slide in a minute, but there's a lot of, you know, how many people think they saw Tupac Shakur as a 3D hologram on stage? No. You know? Or do you guys <laughs> think there's a holodeck? <laughs> yeah, I know you're thinking that. Anyway, um, there's so much. Anytime somebody thinks there's some three dimensional form out in front in a room and stuff, that is 3D. But in this universe, light cannot just start here and, hap and happen. Boom. It, it doesn't work that way. But I want to talk about the real thing. The real thing, the real holograms 
where we have actually been able to reconstruct the wave front from the original light. Now, what am I talking about? Well, yes, first of all, right. let's go on from what holograms aren't into, and this is our approach. The approach that we have primarily, and I'll, I'll go through this relatively fast. It's, it's the old term system theory or, or uh, complexity. Essentially, what we do here is we try to integrate three, three aspects of, of self. And it, we do, it, a lot of this involves science and optics. A lot of this involves uh, art and imaging, but it also involves, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, consciousness or perception. You can't have these without dealing with holography. And so that's where I'm going to hopefully go with this, if it's all right with you guys. Okay, now. So we're going to show some of our work, and because we, here. here. So we got voice come out of nowhere. In, in working with holography. And so we started making work. And we're going to look at a few of our pieces real quickly. These are the Let's teasers. Uh, okay, this is a, a more recent piece. This I did, I think, last year. Go next. This is one of Fred's pieces called the Earth Marker. I think he did this 2009. Next. Uh, this is one of his classic pieces. This is a mandala, it's called Matrix 18, 18R, and that was done back in the 80s. Go ahead. This is a new piece, 19, uh, oh, I don't know, actually this is, a, this is really recent. This is 2017. Uh, this is from a, uh, a hologram that he made uh, with a, uh, a holography foundation in Paris. Go ahead. And now we are getting to, of course, what happens. We show our holograms, and inevitably, even now, people ask us, how do you do that? How does that work? I bet so you that's almost, what we're going to try. I bet you a lot of you asked it. that earlier tonight. Yeah, exactly. Here, here right? Fred. The big question. So a lot of you ask, how in the hell does this stuff work? What are they doing with it? What's going on? What's happening? Do the, um, well. Oh, I, I, this is my part again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's got, she's got the part for the holidays. Hang on a second. So we first got interested in the history. And this is an historical timeline. Uh, and they, 1947, Dennis Gabor is uh, uh, the claimed to be the uh, inventor of holography. And as you can see, it took a little while uh, before uh, holograms were b being made. They really uh, are, are uh, best made with a coherent light source, which is laser that was invented uh, by T.H. Maven in 1960. And then the first uh, optical laser holograms were made in 62 by uh, Emmett Leith and Juris Zupotniks, University of Michigan, and uh, Yuri Denisyuk in Russia. Uh, and then, very early on, a number of artists became involved during that 10-year uh, period between 60 and 70. Uh, there's a whole list of them here. Uh, including Salvador Dali and Bruce Nauman and, and Carpenter Grudersward and, and a number of others, quite a few. Uh, then in 68, the rainbow hologram came along. We'll talk about that. And that makes the hologram in your pocket possible. Uh, you all probably have a credit card or debit card and they have uh, holograms on them. Uh, in 71, uh, Dennis Gabor received the Nobel Prize for holography. And in 72, the integral hologram was made, the first uh, hologram that was uh, joined with uh, cinematography. And that was done by Lloyd Cross, and that it was Fred's teacher. So anyway, those are the Hollywood. You have to pay that homage to those guys. Actually, what's very interesting about holography 
and where we entered into holographies. Can you imagine if you know about photography? If you had sat down with Fox Talbert or Matthew Grady or some of the early photographers, it's very interesting to know the very beginners at these stages. Right, go uh, Yuris Denishuk and Emma Leith were making holograms six weeks apart from each other, one in Russia, one in the United States, unbeknownst to each other. And Yuris Denishuk felt he should have got the Nobel Prize also for holography. And they both died. Uh, a few years ago, six months apart from each other. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, incidentally, you're a finisher. Don't ever try to drink with the Russians. <laughs> they will put you under the table. Anyway, um, but now we want to get serious. We want to get down. Everybody ready? Yes. I'm ready. Okay. Now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to need a little help with this. Oh, she's 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 gonna yeah. she's gonna help you. <laughs> now, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Can you shut that off? All of it. Can we shut off the projectors? Everything. <laughs> Got your hologram. Do you want me to unplug the hologram? Can you unplug the hologram? This always makes giving this talk sure. difficult. Is this good enough? This is spooky. Uh, Becky, go to the next slide. Yeah, go to the next slide. Um, so let's talk about this. Do you see me? Um, yeah, yeah kind of go with me. You can yeah. just barely see me, right? Yeah. Now turn on the lights. Yeah. Turn on the light, Fred. Turn on the Oh, that's the right. Bulb. That's my clue. <laughs> that's my clue. Okay, turn it off. <laughs> Our poor eyes are freaking out. Okay. Now, you don't see me very well, right? <laughs> do you see me? Yes. Or do you see the... the now, just do you see me? Now, do you see me? What's the difference? Now, do you see me? Yes. yes. Hey. Do you see me? No. What? Now, do you see me? No. No. I see half of you. What do you mean by see? What do I mean by see? Yeah, you would have to bring that up. <laughs> so, now, what's my point? Do you see me? No. Does everybody agree that you don't see me? Yes. <laughs> now, do you see me? Yes. Partially. Partially. Do you see me? Do you see me? Do you say you see me? Now, do you see me? No. Why not? So now, do you see me? No. See the light. See the light. <laughs> now, do you, do you agree? Do you see me? Yeah. What are you doing talking? <laughs> do you see me? Yes. You see me? Yes. Now, now, do you see me? No. Now, do you see me? No. Yes. <laughs> What's the difference between now and now? So do you see me or do you see the light? Do you all agree that you don't see me? Do you agree now that you don't see me, but you see the light that is reflected off of me? Now, now this, the understanding holography is directly proportional to your ability to to grok this. Anybody remember that? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> do, you, do you see me? I see the light see reflected the light. from you. You see the light reflected from me? Yes. Okay. Now, 
That's very similar to what a hologram captures. No, let's talk about that. Let's see how we can put that together. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some stuff that goes into the nature of light, okay? Onward. We can turn the lights back on, right? Now. We can turn uh, the should we turn the lights on, back right? on? Yeah, yeah, we'll turn the light back on a little bit. Now, do you, do you see me? <laughs> what do you see? But you have to be a little more precise than that. Anyway, here's, here's the thing. This is the thing that's exciting about this. And I keep being involved in holography. I've been involved in it 40 years, and new stuff keeps coming up all the time. And we've just heard about something incredible that speaks to exactly how holography works. How many of you heard about the, uh, the latest thing, the LIGO uh, project? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, it's, it's the project that proved that there are, there are um, what am I blocking? Gravity. Gravitate gravity waves. But you know what's even more profound than that? That they don't talk about. Waves got to wave something. So there's also a definition about the fact that something is being waved, that the waves are, are recording. And they captured the sound waves of um, black, uh, black holes smacking into each, to the, each other a billion years ago. But what it did is it made waves. What's absolutely incredible is that, that that's what's called interferometry light interacting with itself. Now, we can't even talk about that until we talk about what, what the hell a wave is. Anyway, there's one other thing that is very interesting, very exciting, you may have heard about. And that is the idea about the, the, that we are living in a universe that is typical to a hologram. And we'll talk, we'll end up on that a little bit later, but that's that's so mind-zoggling, I can't hardly even deal with it. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. So let's get into this. Tonight, we're integrating biology, psychology, and physics. And we'll see how they go together, OK? Onward. These are the concepts I would like you to get a handle on. The first one is a light wave. And what the heck is a light wave? The second thing is, what is a wave front? And then, then we go into what is interference, what is diffraction, and what is an interference filter. And then last thing is a little bit of talk on mirrors and lenses. Now most of us have had some dealings with a little bit of this somehow, but, but I want to talk, here's, here's my methodology tonight. What I want to do is talk about these, then I want to come back and put them together in how a hologram works. Oh, thank you. <laughs> is that all right with everybody? Yeah. yeah. Other words, you know, you might you might say, well, I don't know if I want to hang into all this tech stuff for a while, but we will give you art breaks, okay? <laughs> we will look at some art stuff. Now, I also have had a hell of a time finding the the stuff I wanted online, so we've made them up. And I got to tell you, Becky is a really good graphic artist, and we worked our butts off to try to achieve this. But let's, let's this is a little bit of the precursor of what this is all about. And this is how this starts. How does it start? Now, let me ask you, how do you see me? No. Do you, saw, you see the light reflectors. Where does that start? Now, if you were really being in true systems theory, you'd say coal, water falling from different levels, natural gas, or nuclear reactor. Because that creates electricity that then causes light to be propagated, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is light is how I begin to come to you. Because I'm not coming to you, it's the the information about me. So what happens? So what happens here is 
But like, I can do this. Oh hell, I'll do it by hand. Anyway, the light's coming off of, and, and so let's just talk about light for a second. The nature of light. And what is light? So I'm going to ask you some simple, direct questions. You all, you all agree that you see me because you see the light reflected from me, right? Where did the light start? From the light, from the light bulbs, right? So, so the, you, you say the light's coming off the light bulb, striking me. Do you agree? Yes. All right. There's light. Or here's here's light. Show me the light between my fingers. You can't see it. You can't see it. What do you mean? But you're seeing me. Now, th th this incidentally is a pretty much of an interesting opening question. Mm -hmm. You don't see light very much directly. You can see light coming straight at you. But you really, in order to see objects, the light has to be manipulated or messed up by the object. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah, Yes. Now, so, so what happens here is, is step one, the light comes out. Step two, it hits the object. Now, what's it doing? It hits the object. Some of it's absorbed. Some of it's, it's uh, uh, well, this and like, like, uh, like, what color is this shirt? I don't know. I don't know. What is it? What color is this? <laughs> Is that blue? <laughs> anyway, the important thing to understand is that this thing is every color but this color. Because this is the color that's reflected from it. Now, what happens then? These things are wave fronts. These are wave fronts. The light coming from an object is a wave front. Now, what is it a wave front of? And this goes into information theory. The, the light coming from the wave front is carrying information of the cup. It's cupness. It's the quality of light, but it's in the it's in the wave front. So now, what's happened? There's been a transformation. The object is messed up. Now. Uh, Mess up the light. Now the light that strikes it has been filtered to some degree, changed, and the information is traveling out in the room. Then the information goes into the eyeballs, and we don't need to go into that because that's a whole other talk. We're going later. You know, it's a whole thing, and we'll cover that a little bit later. But this is how we're seeing. So now. Let me ask you something about this. Where's the, oh, there ain't any, there ain't any light here. There we go. So, do you all see the cup? No, we see the Oh, I'm going to have to turn off the light. <laughs> Do you see the cup? Yes. <laughs> what do you see? Light. Okay, now you agree that you're not hearing the cup, tasting the cup, smelling the cup. Any, your only experience is, is light, right? Right. Visually, in parentheses, visually, the cup is everywhere in the room that the light off the cup can go. Now, because because over there, Paul, do you see the light from the cup? Yes. Okay. Now, Susan, do you see the light coming off the cup? I do. Now, let me ask you a question, Paul. Do you see the handle? No. Susan, do you see the handle? I do. So, what does that say about that information? Well, there's only one handle. Yeah. <laughs> great. God damn, that's great. So now what, if Paul sees it without the handle, 
and Susan sees it with the handle, what does that mean about the light that's reflected from the cup? It's bouncing How about the fact that it's different for him and different for her? So now, if you, under, if you notice here, I'm working on your reality a little bit here. And I'm trying to pull it a little bit. You don't see the cup, you see the light reflected from the cup. Okay? Now, the cup can be... Now, what color is the cup? Red. Everything except red. Everything except red. <laughs> And so the information can be changed from one cup to one cup to another. This is going everywhere in the room. Do you, anybody disagree? Okay, all of you agree that. Now, one last question here, and this is a little bit off the subject, but very pertinent to what we're saying. What size is the cup? Cup size. Average size is a six ounce cup, right? It's an average of small. Here's the thing. If you guys in the middle, hold up your fingers about how big you see the cup. Back there, how big do you see the cup? Look at those guys back there, it's a little bitty for them. Why is it little? Distance. What does the distance mean? That the, that the information from the cup is spreading out. The wave fronts of information are filling the whole room, but more of it gets into your eye when you're close and less of it gets to your eye when you're far back. It's an, it's, it goes by proportional inverse square law, but we won't go into that right now. So these are the precursors. Wave fronts. Now, so what's a wave front? So what would you say a wave front is? <laughs> oh, how'd that get in there? Oh, do you see that one? Uh, this is Shades of Earth Past. A few of us have been surfing. We've had close relationships to different kinds of waves. Anyway, again, you know, what we're talking about here is we're, we're talking about um, Hegel and we're talking about um, um, Thomas Young, Thomas Young. We're not talking about Einstein. These, we're not going to talk about photons and particles and all that stuff. We're going to talk about waves. It's a lie, but it's the best lies I know how to tell you how holography works. Of course, it could be one or it could be the other. Go on. Or it could be both. Now, or, or it could be both. And the thing we want to look at is a wave. Wave is a particle that has electromagnetic energy that tends to has a tendency to oscillate up and down, up and down, up and down. It's probably going on in a circular formation over there, but god dang, that would be really hard to try to explain. Okay? Yep. So now, uh, Onward. What makes the cup red as opposed to a blue cup? The length of the wave. The length of what wave? Hmm? Here's yeah. Uh, we got everything. Basically, what's happening? This is this is that whole thing. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the, to give you an idea of the dynamics of the electromagnetic spectrum, if you put wave by wave by wave you could accomplish something that would say go from New York to Los Angeles. Then out of all of those waves, you took a pinhole and put a pinhole in it. And you had the kind of waves come out of a pinhole of that much of dynamics. That's how much of that energetic field we're seeing as light. Okay? That means there's a whole lot going on out there and that's a whole other talk in itself. But what's important to understand, just briefly, is that waves. the rate at which the wave goes up and down, or frequency, determines its color. For the most part, light is traveling at a united, at a, the common speed, which is 
The speed of light. 396,000 miles or 300 million maybe. Anyway. <laughs> but the, the important part is, so the question is, when we start making holograms, and, so, and, and just to let you in on what we're doing in holography is trying to capture that wave front. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. But if you imagine white light, like this light, what color is this light? The whole spectrum. All, 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 all the colors. All the colors. All the colors. Now, you holographers, shut up, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the problem. Here's, here's the interesting situation. Do we have, I'm trying to remember where we have that. Yeah, now's the time to do it. Uh, Anna, do you want to be able to do something? You want to plug in that light for a second? Okay. Here, I need to, here, I'm going to give you. I know this is underwhelming, but I'm going to give you all give you a hologram. And, and uh, it's way too hard to keep track of what this all are. I'm going to try to try to make sure they all. Oh, everybody gets one sometimes. There you go. So many holograms. It's Christmas. I told you they're going to be underwhelming. Here, take a few of them here. Here you go. A few of them like this. <laughs> you see that light over there? What color is that light? Rainbow. Rainbow. Also, you can look at this light over here, and you notice it, it's like... Here, you guys get some more of this. Just pass them down. So, so... Why do you think, am I getting to some point, well, why do you think that we want to have a, a, a kind of a light bulb that puts out one color? Why would you want that? Be boring. Well, here's the deal. Imagine if you're an artist and you're going to draw a drawing and you were trying to hold a hundred different colored pencils. How would it work? It wouldn't be fairly difficult. We use lasers not because they're so fantastic. We use lasers because they are possible. It's the possibility of producing one monochromatic color. Like this laser show. Oh, leave it for a while. <laughs> the, the reason we use lasers is not only are they monochromatic, but they, all the light, the light is functioning like a wave. It's all going on and off, on and off, on and off. Did you get that idea that light's coming on, on and off, on and off, on and off? Well, I can't really do much more to, but to tell you that that's, um, uh, if we, that slide that we got ahead of was, was the one that showed the difference between incoherent and incoherent light, that one? Back, Back a couple. There we go. See this? Oh, look at this. A pointer. Uh, incidentally, it's a laser. Actually, that's, this isn't a laser. This is a cat toy. So, anyway, white light is a whole bunch of frequencies together. And if we were to try to use them, they're too complicated. Regular lasers, not even that well, because they're putting out the same frequency, the same wavelength of light. Not only that, but they're very directional as opposed to omnidirectional. But the real unique thing about the kind of lasers we need to use is all of the light is going on and off, on and off, on and off in step. Now, how do we show you that? Well, let's zip ahead. OK. Uh, let's pay a little bit of tribute to oh, laser safety. Here's, here's the other token we always have to do. Before we get started. Rick, do the, can you hear us all right? Are you you're hearing me okay? Yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, say something back about about this. 
Okay, there are several different classes of lasers. We usually about, use about a one or two, but you can you can get, uh, which we didn't bring pictures of, lasers as big as, uh, which are huge. They're rooms and rooms and warehouses of, of a laser. And, uh, but you can see that, you can see the laser beam there on the table. Fred and I are working on the table there. But there are regulations all over about how so much laser light you can be exposed to. So now, now you can say we've talked about using lasers and the Bureau of Radiation Health cannot get mad at us. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Just so we wanted to tell you that. Yeah. The thing about lasers is lasers come in a, in a variety of wavelengths or colors. Some of them it's laser in four different yeah. colors Fred. simultaneously. Here, Fred. The mic, Fred. Fred. Oh, the yeah. mic? Yeah, the mic would be helpful. Oh. Is the mic helpful? Yeah, I'll try to hold it here. I'll just start it. Anyway. Incidentally, the, 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 this light, monochromatic coherent light, was not seen by man until 1960. And the amazing thing about it is the ideas about it could have happened a long time before. It yes. just took a few people to get it figured out to make it work. The very first laser was a pulse laser that fires in the period of time. We'll get back and talk about that in a moment. But um, now lasers come in a variety of things. These little diodes are the latest things, most of them coming out of Japan, are extremely inexpensive. And quite literally, a laser about a half an inch long is replacing the seven inch, the seven foot laser that I had to put out the same power. Things have changed. Anyway, so let's go into a couple of those details. First of all, do you get the idea that light's a wave and that in order to make holograms because holography is capturing those wave fronts, we had to have a very simple light source, a one color light source that's all in step with itself, okay? Okay. All right, now on the Holograms are made through the interference of light. Here's another one of those little mind blowers. And this is the question that we've been working on all week. Will it work? No? Do you want to try it? Give it a try. Okay, try. We've got everything to lose, right? Here's the point, guys. This this is a diagram. And it's it comes from there it comes. There it comes. All right. Can you, yeah, okay, there. there now, if you noticed here, this is what's really fascinating with light that allows the interferometer to determine uh, uh, gravity waves, but also allows us to do a number of things. If, see, take it and move this one here. If you notice, get, get the wavelengths, yeah, yeah, the color's the same. Oh, the same. Yeah. It's no fun. <laughs> the color's about the same. Oh, go red. Go on and out. Go the other way. Yeah. Go on and out. That's easy. Now, <coughs> do you notice something here? What's happening is these beams are traveling together. And of course, they're traveling very fast. But as this light interacts with itself, it's going on and off, on and off. Incidentally. If all light goes on and off, all the, time. all the time, then the reality of our world is only here half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Chew on that one for a while. <laughs> now, here's what's interesting. What happens if we take and move these? And if you move, move no, this one, yeah. Which one? The, the phase. Now move it slowly. No, 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 go to, go to, to, till it cancels. Till it cancels out. Go to phase till it cancels out. the middle. Yeah. What's happening here? Here's an amazing thing. If these waves are in, out of, if they're, one is going up and the other one's going down, the, the final result is nothing. The light cancels itself out. Now you ask, well, Where's that other light going? You know, it's going into the parallel universe to this one, is it? You gonna go for that one? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, this is vitally important. 
Can you imagine? So imagine if we take simple light and we interact it together in some way and we can, can capture the difference between the light in step and out of step, we'll be able to, to use that as a, a method for understanding wave fronts. So let's go on here. Now I tell you, we've got, I can't tell you how many ripple tanks and diagrams and stuff we've gone through. <laughs> Any of you from, ever been in Irvine, California? If you know Irvine, there's a Michelson Street everywhere. <laughs> Michelson got the Nobel Prize for this, incidentally. Laser, which you can just about see here. And you run it out here, and you take a, what's called a beam splitter, split the beams, and have the beams come back together. They get on top of each other, like this. If you want to look at that further, you can put lens in here and spread that out. And what happens is you get what's called a zone plate or interference fringes. Okay. So what that is, is that's a visual way of seeing the interference. You got it right there. So there it is. Our, uh, one of our caretakers couldn't look at this, it made her sick. <laughs> but anyway, here's the thing to understand. You're now, this is looking right down at the center of two laser beams on the top of each other, and you're looking at about hundreds of wavelengths of light. What do you mean by top of They are two beams lined up, right? Oh. What happens, like, this is LIGO. And this thing goes to the beam splitter, goes down two and a half miles and come back, two and a half miles and comes back, and then it hit off this reflector and come back to a detection site. And so this light's going here, and this light's going here, and they interact. And you can measure changes in the atmosphere by find hundred thousandths of a meter, which is how they detected sound. Okay, now, now the one last thing about this is phenomenal. Every other thing we've ever used as humans to understand the universe around us is light. So we have taken participation in the last few weeks of the determination of something in space by its sound waves. And we've heard sounds before but not proof that light is traveling. I mean, that sound, sound is traveling billions of miles in space. Anyway, welcome to that age. Let's go on. But it's the same thing we all use. We use those interferometers to see how stable our systems are. Here we go. Now, it so happens, how many of you, how many of you have got physics backgrounds? Okay, do you, you all recognize, uh, ah, I see it. You guys have been very patient with me. Anyway, um, what's also amazing about holography is the thing that's amazing about holography is the thing that's amazing about the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment is amazing, the major conundrum around quantum mechanics, quantum physics. Is light a wave or is light a particle? Or it's a, it's a part of wavable or wave particle. And there's, that's a whole talk in lectures in itself. I wouldn't about, be about to take it on. Except that what you can see is there's light coming from two places. That's a single source. As these waves interact with each other, we get, they, they add themselves up or cancel themselves out. And the net result is that. Incidentally, that's wrong. But... Uh, uh, what happens, they get dimmer as they get further away from each other. I was absolutely amazed at how many things I saw online that are not right. <laughs> anyway, let's go on. Now, here's another thing that's absolutely important to understand. And, and not very many people understand what an interference filter is. What an interference filter is, and they become very popular because what they do is they make, they make filters out of layers and layers and layers of deposits of material. 
What's really unique about this is that when you shine white light into this, which they haven't shown very well, two things happen. Okay, Fred. The, uh, so what happens here is this filter reflects off and, and, and bounces out and some of the light passes through or doesn't even pass through at all, that will get caught in there. Now why do we care about that? Well that's a key to reflection holography and we'll get back to that in a moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so here's the thing to understand. This filter is a filter, you know a filter is something where it lets red light, green light, or blue light through. This is a filter that's very selective about that. Okay, let's just go on. Okay, so back to the slide. Now, what we're going to talk about is the nature of light. They're talking about light rays bouncing off the object. We've already been there. But we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about windows, more particularly lenses, and we're going to talk about mirrors, and more particularly mirrors. On our We're getting close to a break, so hang on. Now, how many of you are familiar with lenses? How many of you? You took my line. <laughs> the important thing about lenses is, is that they're, that, you know, we've all used cameras. We've got them in our little cell phones or whatever the hell it is. And, and we also have lenses in our eyes, which I'll get to in just a minute. But here's the two things that are important to understand about two kinds of lenses. It's very simple. This lens here, can you guys see over there at all? Oh, that's over there. So if you look at the top diagram, the top diagram is what's called a positive lens. You'll say, oh, that's a convex, convex lens. Yeah, it's a convex, convex lens. But what it does to the light is it focuses to a focal point. Now, what's the, what's the difference between that lens and the bottom lens, which you call the negative lens? Why is it a negative lens? The light never focuses back there at that focal point behind the lenses. The light spreads out. Now, why am I talking about that? That's very important. Because holograms are nothing but sophisticated lenses and mirrors. So if you can get the idea of how lenses work, and get the idea of how mirrors work, you can get the idea about how large she's working. Onward. Okay, wait, 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 can we stop it? No, we can't, yeah, we can. Okay, ready for a little break? Ready. Um, so, what, so here's the thing. You can make holograms that are used, uh, used as uh, what are called diffraction. And diffraction gradients break up light. You have a cross diffraction grading in your hands that I gave out to you. That's a very simple hologram, it's a printed hologram. What it does is it takes light and breaks it out. Now what happened for me is, um, in my background, I've, I've been very much for years and years interested in ancient Hindu, Buddhist uh, imagery and symbology. And so, I happen to run across the idea that if I do a series of lenses, they start to behave and act like mandalas. Mandala meaning circle. Here's just a little squirt of some classic mandala imaging. Have all of you, have everybody, has anybody not seen these? Has everybody seen uh, art, uh, Indian art? Okay. So, taking that, Went a long time. Anyway, here's a series of stuff that, that are my, my work. My work is kinetic mandalas. 